This is an explicit podcast where we try to keep the conversations as raw and authentic as possible with no intentions of hurting anyone. So if you're very woke, religious, or sensitive, we highly recommend you do not tune in. Yeah, I was saying just now, let's say you start a mm. YouTube channel, right? Mm. Okay, actually, so. I, I'm quite puzzled how, if you say you're starting a YouTube channel, mm. how, how do you get your contents out there? You know what I mean? It's, yeah, I, how do you get people to sort of search your contents and actually look at That's it? The, you know? the tricky That's the part, tricky uh. bit, isn't it? So, traffic coming in is similar to, let's say, you open a restaurant, uh, mm. right? So, you open mm. a restaurant, food is good, mm. you have nice interior design, mm. 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 but where is the customers coming from, mm. you know? Mm. So, um, that is the tricky part. Um, I still remember when I first uh, uploaded my first video, mm. right? Mm. Somehow, mm. I thought that... Uh, I I think it's common among a lot of YouTubers. Uh, you think mm. that your video that, that you uploaded, right, you get more than you actually get, you know? Mm, 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 then you realize like, where is the traffic coming from? It has mm. to come from somewhere. Yeah, uh. If people don't know you at all, then it's very mm. tough. You know, you have to yeah. stand out uh, competition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, we are rolling already uh, anyways. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, all right. All right. <laughs> okay, uh, guys, this is Let's Get It Podcast. BK here, your host. We, we are at episode, I think, um, 61. We have Dr. Iqbal in the house today, ENT doctor, um, aka otolaryngologist. Right, morning. Yeah, I. Um, it took me a while to learn how to pronounce <laughs> auto, otolaryngologist, right? Even when I was training, so actually, uh, actually, when we were medical students, I, did, uh, I didn't even know what it was, you know. You know, ENT, ENT. Eh? So. Uh, <coughs> you say otolaryngologist is a short version. There's an otorhinolaryngologist which puts in the nose there as well. Not the mm-hmm. most uh, popular term. I guess um, mm. a pediatrician, optometrist, all those is more mm. common. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Ibal, take me back to the start. Um, mm. I want to know, why? Why did you decide to be a doctor and to choose being an otolaryngologist, you know, amongst all mm. the other many fields? I don't think my story is particularly unique. Um, actually, when I was in school, my best subjects were actually math and physics. Mm-hmm. So at the Mass time, uh, at the time my SPM, my SPM was ninety three. Ninety three. Yeah. Uh, so at the time the economy was still good. And there's lots and lots of scholarships going around. Uh-huh. So I had I had a lot of choices actually. You had a scholarship, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I had I had plenty of choices. So, had, wow. But most of the scholarships that I was offered was engineering. Which uni did you go to? University of Manchester, UK. Oh, but a uh, uh. college over here, is it? Uh no, I trained there. Uh-huh. And I worked there for five, six years before I came back. So basically, right yeah. after high school, you went straight to UK? Yes. Okay, UK, um, yeah. it's a full scholarship? Uh? Yes. Wow. Okay, so you definitely a um, very hardworking student. I wouldn't <laughs> say so. I, I guess um, I wasn't the top student, but I was some, somewhere there. I guess I was in the right school um, at the time when they were the time when companies were looking for scholars to sponsor abroad. Mm. Uh, they were going through schools more than anything else, so they were yeah. looking at the, especially the boarding schools, mm. uh, your MCKKs, your RMCs, you, okay, your MRSM. Yeah. Uh, so I was from RMC, so I was in the right school. Okay, w- where is that school located? Sorry, in Sungai Besi, so military, okay. Royal Military College. Okay, so basically, huh? um, whole life you grew up in KL. Yeah. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanna also confirm. Mm. You are have mixed Chinese blood. Yes, my father is Chinese. Ah, okay. Can't okay. speak Chinese, unfortunately. Uh, that, that's okay. <laughs> not the, not the easiest language to pick up. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Guess what? Uh, I can't speak Chinese. Oh really? <laughs> okay. It makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> uh, we know both the same languages, uh, Yeah. Unless yeah. you know any other language. Malay, other in, than Malay in English only. Yeah, Malay in English. <laughs> okay. Did you always know that you wanted to to be in medicine? No, actually, uh, it's related to the scholarship thing. So yeah. I was always going to do engineering based on my subjects and yeah. stuff. But my father always wanted to be a doctor. Uh-huh. So so oh. he sort of, he didn't say... He, be, wanted, sorry, he, uh, wanted, he wanted to be a doctor, yeah. Well, what did he end up uh, doing, uh, if you don't mind asking? Well, he ended up being an economist and an accountant in the end. Oh, okay, so, okay. <laughs> like I said, I had quite a few scholarship choices. Mm. So Petronas were my sponsors at the time. So yeah. I said to them, okay. I have other scholarship offers, yeah. but if you want me to stay with you, yeah. you offer me medicine, lah. Is it? So, uh, so they actually offered me a medical medical scholarship. This is so. very. I guess it's not common because mm. 
mostly people that end up being a doctor, right? They've mm. probably had a they foreseen that plan maybe two three years beforehand. You, you didn't have much time uh, to to think about the decision, is it? Or? No, no, not really. I mean, we we ha- I have no doctors in my father's side or my mother's side, so okay. I had no role model as such. But I say like my father wanted me to be a doctor, so I thought this opportunity. Or so I I wouldn't say I was really hard into engineering. It was mm. just because that's what most people did. So <laughs> so. So, but I said, okay, why not? Why not try and do medicine? So I decided to do that. Uh, I think it was the right choice, lah. You back then, like eighteen mm. year old, you or seventeen mm. year mm. old, yeah. What did you think about being a doctor then, or going into? Well, st- I mean, studying? we grew up at that time, lah. You know, before all the internet, uh, internet business. It's different, so, different time. So, yeah, basically, we grew up. Uh, your parents would say to you, you are either a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, <laughs> or an architect. Mm. Choose one of them. So. Okay lah, choose doctor. But if if you were up to me, if I had the talent, mm. I would be a professional sportsman. If I had the talent, okay, uh, um, that would be that would be what I would do. Uh, or uh, be a sports journalist. But you can't make much doing sport doing sports though. journalism. Well, anything lah. I was quite into sports when I was in school. Uh-huh. Uh, footballer maybe, but I never had the talent. Which sort of, which sort of uh, sports did you play? Um, record sports mostly. Um, uh. actually, my best game was table tennis. Ping pong, ah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> badminton. Well, I play. I wasn't wasn't very good at it, but okay. I did play as well. I I get actually. It's very. It's a very common dream for many mm. uh, kids uh, around yeah. our age. Um, but it's also like, like of course myself. I played, uh, football. Played uh-huh. badminton. Mm-hmm. First of all, I knew that I wasn't. I I didn't stand out or anything, mm-hmm. So that's when I you 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 wouldn't. Think about pursuing the the type of a uh, career if you know you never had any mm. talent in that mm. mm-hmm. Yeah, so you've always enjoyed sports, eh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you support any football teams? Arsenal. Arsenal. Ah, uh. I'm also a big fan of the Dutch national oh team God. for some reason. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you were for a second. I thought I saw Arsenal. Oh, no, no, my, no. My hospital logo. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry, you said which team? Arsenal. No, no just now yeah. you said what Dutch team? Oh, Dutch national team. Yeah. Uh oh, Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I used to follow a lot when I was uh, younger, and then you know when you stop watching live matches, mm-hmm. uh, then you kind of lose interest. I was very big supporter of Chelsea. All uh. oh, right. Yeah, there's two thousand seven to two thousand twelve uh, mm-hmm. Lampard era. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, huge fan of Lampard uh-huh. last time. Uh. Yeah. Um, oh, you've gone off them already. Then. Sorry. You've gone off Chelsea already. So the last, actually, the last match I watched right was. It's funny, man, because I went to Melbourne. I uh, did mm. my uh, foundation uh, right after mm. high school. Over there, you know, it's three hours ahead or sometimes mm. two hours, mm. right? Mm-hmm. The matches, like, it, it'll be about 2, 3 a.m., you yeah, know, most yeah. of the time. So you, I couldn't really catch the live matches. Mm. Mm. And it's funny that I wanted, I love Chelsea a lot. Mm. They never, they, they never did very well in the Champions League. Mm. The year, they, do you remember? The year that they won the Champions League. This is 2000. 2011, was it? it? The first year I was in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. So that was the first, the last live match that I watched. Oh, okay. Chelsea um, winning the Champions League, uh, John Terry holding the uh-huh. the cup. And yeah, I, I fell off uh, from, from then, didn't uh, follow much really. Because uh-huh. for, for me, like, uh, to support a team, right, you I have to be able to catch live matches. True. Uh, not just the highlights uh, for, for, true, for me. True. Uh, well, because when I, I spent a lot of my adult life in UK, so I went to see a lot of games there. So it's different when you're actually there. Very you know, different. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, I, I also actually wanted to ask a uh, lot about that. Um, uh, so how was that whole experience? Uh, you went right after high school? Yeah, right after SPM. Mm. So I went to Scotland for a year. Scotland so, first? Uh, we did a pre-U there for one year. Okay. And then I moved to Manchester after that. So I've been in Manchester basically around 10 years. 10, 11 years, yeah. You but I'm not a Man U supporter though. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you travelled down also to watch Arsenal. Yeah. Okay. Every opportunity I get. I mean, when oh, yeah. you were ah, yeah, when you're a student, there's not much else. I mean, it's just football and your studies. Eh, that's um, it. <laughs> kind of a, a very great time as well. A lot yeah, of leisure. Yeah. No commitments. You've got no responsibilities. Yeah. You're just there to basically practically enjoy yourself. The, the best time. Uh, uh, trust yeah, me, yeah. I've myself also, I've had yeah. uh, a lot of fun. And then you, I was in business school. Okay. Business so. school is not the same as uh med school, mm-hmm. right? Tell me like is it really true uh, like what people mm-hmm. all think or expect of mm-hmm. uh, medicine school? Like it's very intense or hard working, you barely got time. Um what was it for you? 
Like like with everything else lah. You know, mm. students, you've got some hardworking students, some less hardworking students. Mm. When I was there, they they were in a transition. Before that, medicine was traditionally lectures and lectures and lectures and lectures and non-stop lectures, you know, basically throughout the day. But during my time, they started to introduce this called uh, problem-based learning uh-huh. where you actually had three or four compulsory hours a week. Yep. So the rest of the time is really up to you what you want to do. So, <laughs> so that was hard actually. Yeah. Problem-based learning, you're talking about just more interactive style. <coughs> no, they they have a class yeah. where they present, say, a clinical problem. Mm. So this patient has this, 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 that. Yeah. You're supposed to do reading up around that topic. Yeah. And then later on next week, uh, present, you know, uh, topics uh-huh. to your other colleagues around that. So you have to do a lot of your own study, your own research. Uh-huh. Not a lot of lectures. So... Us being Malaysians, we are used to this spoon feeding, you know. So yeah, yeah. It's, it was quite hard. We struggle quite a lot because you give us free time, we we generally abuse it. So uh, <laughs> that's the, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to generalize Malaysians, I guess it's uh it's students. Uh, it it uh-huh. depends also on the on the person. Myself, yeah. right? Uh-huh. My first year in college I went for maybe eight um eighty ninety percent of the classes tutorials mm. and lectures mm. so mm. they split between two mm. and then second semester um it was only tutorials from then uh, on because mm. lectures is like you said are flexible it's up mm. to you right I also was the type in school I could never f- focus especially in a uh, for me to focus I cannot be around friends that's number one mm. I need to be alone and literally be doing nothing except for hours just mm. what I'm supposed mm. to do uh. mm. so lectures for me was just I would fall asleep within 30 minutes uh. and, and being in the UK and there's yeah. a lot more distractions in here oh, you know, a you, lot more you got, you got your football uh, you mm. got your other things you have you meet new people all kinds of rowdy people so it's yep. You really need a lot of self discipline to to do well there, you know. So uh, a lot of us, a lot of us, uh, a lot of us uh, didn't make it, you know. My year, I think. Oh, really? I think there were thirteen Malaysians who started with me in yeah. year one. I think there were five or six at the end. Okay, so uh, you so um, they were probably uh close close by these people that you hung out with mm. often, and uh, you could see they got uh distracted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> not that they would. I mean, the fact that they were there means they they had done well in school. But oh, definitely. It's just a. Uh, A different environment, you know, a bit of a culture shock, I guess, in a sense. A lot of a culture yeah, shock. Yeah. yeah, so you come to a new country mm-hmm. where a lot of things you've never seen, um, yeah. a lot of entertainment also, um, not to mention you are away from your parents. Your parents, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody there to police you. <laughs> no no one there. Um, freedom, yeah. you want to stay up as late as you want <coughs> and live yeah. up with your friends, True. you are going to do that? <laughs> yeah, like I said, I mean, especially in in the new curriculum that we were in, yeah. flexible hours, that's very bad. You, we need to be told you have to attend this otherwise you won't pass your exam, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. You, you, so, you yeah. need, um, what's that What's that word? Uh? You, you need someone that has jurisdiction over you lah, that yeah, for you to yeah. perform. But I have to say, when I was in UK, we played a lot less sports. I watched more sports than play. So is I, it because yeah. of the the culture itself that you felt like for the local culture it was mm. a a weekly routine right people would be um you would see supporters of Manchester in mm. the subway and then yeah. um, Manchester City and Manchester uh, United right that, at the time Man City was still very small they're not they're not the team they are today definitely yeah yeah I, uh, some Thai oil tycoon took over is it Saudi tycoon yeah the over? UAE lah yeah. that one they took well I think it's quite was a while twenty Two two zero nine or two zero ten. I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, but that time Manchester City, Man, Man, Manchester United were the only team in Manchester. I mean Manchester City was in second or third division at the time. 1993, so, yeah. you went over, is it? Yeah. So the EPL literally just formed. The EPL. Um, no, I went there ninety four. So that was probably the third year of EPL. Yeah. It was very yeah. new. Uh, yeah. Did you notice like um is this the the rivalry uh, between City and uh, United or? There is rivalry, but um, but the city fans didn't have a lot to talk about <laughs> because they they were really rubbish at the time. But, but you have yeah. you have to admire their fans. Mm. Uh, they really stuck with the team. Doesn't matter if the team is in third division; it's still full every hey. week. So that's that's one thing about them. Yeah. When I was younger, then I watched football. Right now, I would think like let's say um someone from uh, Brighton or mm. even a. Uh, division two <coughs> team, mm. right? Then you would think like, who are the people that would support them? It's similar to. Let's say here, you know, you if you grow up in police, you mm. support police team. Mm. You know, I'm not saying anything about police team. I'm just mm. saying mm. that mm. those people are the people that are yeah local. They they yeah. support their local team. So yeah. 
very rarely, I mean, us Malaysians here lah, I live mm. in Manchester but I support Arsenal. Because yeah. I have my my own reasons lah. But yeah. generally, the locals will support their local team. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're not fair weathered. Unfortunately, like Malaysian fans are tend to be fair weathered lah. I mean, sense, if the team's winning, you go see. If the team's losing, uh. the stadium's empty, you know. Uh, you, you that it's generally like that, doesn't happen in the UK. I've never caught local matches. Um, mm. Only when uh, Chelsea came down. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. I'm a Selangor supporter. Uh. So Selangor, um, well, until JDT came around, yeah, they, yeah. they are the biggest team in Malaysia. And even then, uh, it's difficult to get the fans to come to the stadium. Winning is obviously a big factor. You uh. know, uh, um, when they when they win, obviously there'll be more fans coming in. If they lose, and the, fan, the, oh. the, the, the stadium is empty, you know, it's that's normal in Malaysian football. It's it's always been like that. Okay, I I did not know that. Okay, so um, that's interesting. It's it's different, uh, Like um, they are not they are not die hard through the thick no, and thin. No. The die hard <laughs> ones are uh, literally a handful. You're probably talking about one or two hundred people. Mm, okay. And you're talking about the biggest team in historically the biggest yeah, team so in like, Malaysia, oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> in the UK, you can be like say Brighton mm. or Stockport or something like that. Yeah. It doesn't matter; it's full all the time. Did you ever um, experience mm. any like uh, violence or what? Yeah, yeah, violence. Uh, in oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. First hand, yeah, first hand. Um, there's one experience I'll never forget. It was the UEFA Cup final uh, between uh, Arsenal and Galatasaray. Yeah, yeah. That was in 2000. Galatasaray is Dutch, right? Uh, no, Turkish. Turkish, 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 Turkish team. team uh. Okay. That was in 2000 in Denmark. Okay. It was a war zone. Oh, dear. The fans fought in the city. They were throwing uh, chairs. Oh, outside the bottom. stadium also, they are fighting. In the town. In the town. So we, I was there. Oh, my God. What the hell did I get myself into? So I was hiding in McDonald's, you know. It's that intense. Uh. Wow, the Turkish fans was... Oof. I mean, you always hear about hooliganism. But yeah, to yeah. be in the middle of... Yeah, yeah. Where the action is, yeah, it's like quite it's scary. It's going on. It's actually going it, on. It, it's literally war. They were throwing bottles, tables, everything. This is right after the match, uh. Before. Before the match, they're fighting. Before the match. <laughs> before the match. No, it, it's planned. A lot of these hooligan groups, they mm. plan beforehand to clash, right? That is the sort of activities that they enjoy, or uh, they... Uh, they like they use football. They use football as an excuse to fight, right? Usually. Okay. But of course... Uh, As fans, we get caught lah in the middle. Luckily, yeah. I had no family at the time. I didn't bring uh. my kids or anything lah, so I was single. <laughs> so was, I just had to take care of myself. Yeah. <laughs> so after um, what, what happened after the match? Did they fight even more? Um, <laughs> in a sense, uh, we were lucky that Arsenal lost. We had had the Turkish team lost. Yeah. I think uh, there'll be more fights after that. Lah. I think um, Arsenal would have been the favorite. Is it back then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it was a big disappointment lah, but. In a way, it was a blessing. We we lost the game because there will be more fights after that. Yeah, know? probably they're scared yeah. or scared yeah. of winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's get back to some more serious stuff. <laughs> Generally, the medical course mm. is five years. Yeah. Um, in Manchester, it can be six. Mm. Uh, because I didn't do A levels. So we we did uh, one, uh in Scotland we did Scottish highest. Yeah. So I had to do an extra year pre university year in Manchester before I can get into the medical school proper lah. When did you have to choose a uh, pick auto laryngology? Oh, we never know that until after we graduate. Means after the five years. Yeah. In fact, uh, after five years, we got a year of housemanship. Mm. Okay, and yeah. then you got your after that you got your senior housemanship. Yeah, uh, that, another, that can yeah. go on. They can go on for several years. It's all usually during the senior housemanship that you decide. First of all, whether you want to do you want to be a surgeon or a physician. Yep. Or a psychiatrist. So these yeah. I did, I did three of them. Yeah. Because of course, um, internal medicine there are many branches. Surgery there are many branches. Yeah, so yeah. you decide first and foremost: are you a physician or a surgeon? Yeah. Or a psychiatrist. If you yeah. don't like either one of them. Yeah. Uh, then, once you say you decide, okay, I'm not a physician. I'm a surgeon. Then you decide what sort of surgery you want. Yeah. Uh, then you see lah. You are interested in digging up the tummy or looking to uh-huh. noses. Or you want to be a heart surgeon, lung yeah. surgeon, or whatever it is lah. Or you like bones and be orthopedic. Uh, so you only decide that when you start working in a specific department and you see the sort of surgeries that you they do there, and that tickles your fancy. Then, then yeah, then you 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 go for it. So I heard this from a, another doctor. He mentioned like basically after you finish the five six years, you do your housemanship in the housemanship. What happens is you are rotated between departments. Is that what happened as um, well? During my time, we only did medicine and surgery and psychiatry only. Okay. Um, so 
um, we didn't have compulsory gynecology like in Malaysia you have to do hmm. gynecology in your in your house yeah. we didn't have that so okay. so we didn't have a lot of exposure to to gynecology so just those three main branches hmm. and then after that then you apply for jobs in whatever most most of the time we just apply in whatever we can get lah say um, if you want to be a surgeon mm. then we have uh, what you call the surgical rotation so to speak so you apply that job for two years or three years where you rotate every six months into different specialties yeah. uh, then after that then you decide lah what you so so why how did you end up in uh, laryngology otolaryngology well f- like I said first of all I decided I'm a surgeon and not a physician yeah. so um I quite enjoyed um, general surgery. General surgery is basically mm. abdominal surgery, like your bowel surgery and things like that. So I quite enjoyed that. Uh, then I did um, ENT. I think initially what what attracted me was that uh, ENT had not they don't have a lot of after hours work. ENT. Uh, in terms of emergencies. Why uh, so? Uh, is there a particular reason why it's that way? Um, It's, it's, it's just a case where, you know, you rarely have um, emergencies where you have to come in at 3 o'clock in the morning to do. Mm. That's what I thought initially. Yeah. Uh, because in general surgery, there's always emergencies, you know. You do, there's always yeah, operations yeah. in 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Where you, but when we were there, the, the disease scope is, is different from uh, what it is in Malaysia. Mm. ENT in the UK is not the same. So ENT in the UK, the things you get out, out of hours basically nosebleeds, simple things like that. Uh-huh. Uh, but in Malaysia, the disease is quite a lot more severe. And but uh, why? Why so? Uh? Why? How come it's it's different? Um, I think health awareness is better in the UK. So you rarely get people leaving cancers uh, on them for oh, a okay. year or two <laughs> before mm, actually see, seeing see. someone. So they tend to get things quite early in the UK. So Routinely, it's rut- um, it's normal for them to have routine medical checkups. Uh, that's what um, you're saying. More yeah, common, but they, uh. Uh, they they tend to know when to see the doctors. You know, uh, when, whereas in Malaysia, you know, they they try their best not to see a doctor until it's, until the family literally drags them to the, to the doctor to see. You see, so things tend to get quite late. So, but yeah, when when I came back, um, the sort of diseases that we see here are a lot different from what I saw in the UK. You would say uh, here it's uh, more intense? A lot more variety. Uh. Uh, severity is a lot more. Over there, yeah, I mean, we do get some cancer surgeries. Um, but most of it is routine, kind of like sinus surgery, a bit of ear surgery. Uh, like I said, the... The, the emergencies are mostly nosebleeds. Over here, you get airway emergencies, people who can't breathe, you know, uh, you know that, that sort of thing. So it was quite an eye-opener when I got here. So altogether, how many years you've, you've been at ENT? Uh, well, um, when I was in UK, I wasn't an ENT specialist yet. Yeah. So I was still a medical, a, a medical officer here. I mean, senior houseman there. Mm. So the director of the, of UKM came around mm. to basically entice us to come back, lah. Say okay, please come back. You know, I, we've got a training spot for you. Basically, there. they need. They need uh, you so guys. they they promised us. I mean, I was never going to go back unless uh, they prom- promised me a training spot for, to be a specialist. Uh-huh. Because in the UK, one of the big problems, especially in surgery, yes. is to get a spot in the training program. That's so competitive. What do you mean get a spot in the... Once you graduate, yes. and then you, did your, you do your housemanships and mm. your sisma- senior housemanship, then you have what we call the specialist training or yeah. registrar training. That yeah, one yeah. you have to apply and compete for. Okay. Uh, so... Not many people get it. Okay. So you have to do publications, do PhDs just to get into the program. So at that time, we were all still struggling to try and get into the program. Mm. So at that time, I was in my third or fourth year of, of being a senior houseman. I said, oh, it's getting a bit late now. Mm. So then the UKM director came said, come back. Mm. We guarantee you a spot in the training program. I said, okay, yeah. fine. Okay. And then uh, I think it was the right decision. But some of my friends who stayed there to fight on mm. uh, for for the training spot never actually got it and ended up being a GP. Mm. So um, came came back here and that's when you met your wife. Huh? Oh, funny enough, I've met my wife on online. On online? Uh, yeah. Wait, she's not. Uh, is, she's she's a not a doctor. No. no, my 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 wife is a lawyer, but she's a she's a housewife right now. So at the time we didn't have Facebook. No, that's why I was wondering. Uh, we had back then. We, we had something <laughs> called Friendster. Have you heard of it? That's not too long ago, actually. 
Yeah. It, was, it was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> my my it was nothing as nowhere near as sophisticated as uh, as Facebook. Oh, but Instagram. that was the thing we had last time. Mm. So I met her through friends actually. She was in, uh, she was also in the UK, but I never met her in the UK. So same she, time as you at that time. Like she's she's five years younger. Okay. But she was there when I was there. Yeah, yeah. We had, actually we had some common friends, but we never met. So I actually met her on Friendster, and I met her in Malaysia actually. Mm, okay. Uh, but that was towards the end of my time in UK lah. Okay, okay. So I only saw her during summer holiday. Honestly, I look at your videos, right? Especially the ones where you scope into all sorts of holes. Uh. Mm. For me, it's a bit hard for me to go and look at all those videos because yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm a pussy lah about these things. It's a bit just too much for uh, me. Some some people uh some people like it. I mean, in fact, most of my some followers are immune to it. Uh, some 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 of my followers follow me just because they wanted to see all these gory videos. Because know? it's it's yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Because I um yeah, it's interesting because they you don't normally see surgeries. Yeah. And luckily Instagram don't censor these things lah. Um Facebook and all. Hey, I'm surprised, uh, man. I saw one video right that mm. you posted literally the you operating on the neck mm. uh-huh. you know and i was thinking oh wow, instagram just um instagram tiktok yeah. cannot 100% TikTok cannot tiktok cannot uh, instagram yeah. doesn't doesn't say luckily for me lah i yeah. got nothing to post how um, <laughs> you've been posting um um since the start you've also been posting on tiktok is it um i tried for a while on tiktok yeah. but they keep on censoring eventually they block when it comes so <laughs> <laughs> no, no so way, cannot. bro! No way they will. Yeah. Uh, TikTok will not accept all this one. Yeah, yeah. I use TikTok only f- to get the soundtrack. Uh, what do you mean? The music background. Oh, okay. Because uh, Instagram on Android, I've got very limited uh, soundtrack, so I have to use TikTok just to get the background music. You mean you use TikTok and then you upload it on? On Instagram, is it? You uh, use I use TikTok to just to do the video and then yeah. delete it straight away and then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then put it on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's. Hey, I want to mm. start off with something simple. Mm. Sinus, mm. right? Sinus very common. A lot of people <coughs> have it. You know, a lot of kids have it as well. Mm. Uh, what What is it actually? There's two things that people like to say sinus and another thing we like to see in Malaysia is resdung. Basically, so, sinus. Uh, si- sinus and resdung. To us, to me, like as an ENT doctor, doesn't mean a lot because resdung is when you ask someone, "Oh, I have resdung," and they just say they just say that term to, to encompass everything that is to do with the nose, lah. Uh, everything to do with the nose is resdung, lah. So, when somebody comes to the clinic and say, uh, "Doctor, I have resdung," I, I always ask them, "What do you mean?" Uh, so they then they, from the symptoms that you get, sinus, sinus. The word sinus is basically empty cavities in your skull. So you got sinus in your cheeks, in between your eyes, in your forehead, and one in the middle of your skull. Whereas sinusitis is a disease. Uh-huh. Sinus is just empty cavities in your head. But isn't isn't that normal to have empty cavities? Yeah, that's normal. Yeah. Everybody's got sinus. So when people say sinus, sinus means what they're trying to say is sinusitis, which means infection uh-huh. of the sinus. All right. Mm. Uh, that's what even some doctors will use. But in, to the lay person, sinus means can be just itchiness, allergy, mm. uh, rhinitis, sinusitis, all of it is sinus. So the our job as an ENT doctor is to decipher what you actually mean by that sinus. Okay, uh, wow, it's a very um, uh, broadly used term and yes, often misused yes. also. All the time misused. Lah. So, <laughs> yeah. Allergies, you talk about rhinitis, which is uh, inflammation of your nose, and you've got sinusitis, which is infection of your sinus cavities. These are all sort of interrelated, but they are different. Okay, um, why do people get running nose? You know, our running nose is basically a physiological reaction to an irritation to the nose. So irritation can be allergens, things that you're allergic to. Yeah. Once these things get into your nose, then your nose will start to run. They start to swell and you get inflamed. Uh, and then you start to sneeze, start to become itchy. So these are all al- allergic reactions. From experience, uh, I've. Mm. I know a couple of uh, friends, uh, especially when they're younger, they have running nose all the time. Mm-hmm. So it has. To, w- would that mean that they are surrounded by that thing, that particular thing that they are allergic to all the time? Yes, That's yes. Uh, the most common allergen is what we call dust mites. Mm. Uh, these are basically parasites that live in uh, your linen, in dust, so in far. books. Uh, so what these uh, parasites do is that they their feces in the morning tend mm. to disperse in the air 
in the morning and you inhale these things and you start sneezing and start uh, get uh, getting runny nose in the morning. Typically, this runny nose and sneezing happens in the morning. It's because oh. of the dust mites. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah. s- somehow these, um, you, you say these dust mites are mm. in the morning, they're active. Is it? Yeah, they, they tend to disperse their feces in the morning. In the mo- oh my morning. God, okay. Yeah. Those who get runny nose every morning is mo- mostly because of that. There's another type of uh, rhinitis we call non-allergic rhinitis uh, where people tend to react to change in temperature. Some people, when they get into an aircon room and they start to, you know, starts to run. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's slightly different. Uh, why, why is that? Uh? Like, why, why do they uh, get it? We call vosu, vesumotor rhinitis. Because of change in temperature, then your body t- starts to react as if it has uh, some kind of an allergy. So okay. Then uh, it's, the nose starts to run. Okay, that one is due to temperature, not uh, a particular thing. Environment change. That one uh, is less common compared to the ones that uh, uh, those who are allergic to organic stuff like, like um, dust mites, for example. People who get nose bleeds. Uh, when, mm. I, when I was younger, I mm. would get nose bleeds very often. Mm. My doctor told me it's because you stay, you sleep in the an air conditioning uh, room, right? But when I grew older, it, <coughs> it stopped. It just kind of stopped. Uh, mm. Like what, what actually happened? Uh? Uh, this is something I talked about yesterday on TV3 as well. Yeah. It's nose bleeds. Uh, nose bleeds are common, but they're never normal. You know? uh, you're not su- your nose is not supposed to bleed. So whenever a patient comes in with nose bleeds, uh, I always tell them, please see your ENT doctor and check. Most of the time, it's because of a blood vessel that's just inside your nose, yeah. in, the, in your bone here in the middle. Yeah. Okay, that blood vessel uh, tends to be quite prominent in those people who have nose bleeds. Lah. So what can trigger the nose bleeds? Uh, sometimes heat. If you're in a hot sun outside, what happens when you're hot outside, the blood vessels tend to dilate and become, when it dilates and becomes more fragile and tends to bleed. And oh. another thing can cause it as well. Uh, this aircon is not necessarily because when, when you have aircon, sometimes your nose tends to get a bit dry. Uh, when it gets a bit dry, then the blood vessels on the surface of your nose tends to uh, break and then you can get a bit of nosebleed. But these kind of nosebleeds are usually not severe. For my case, uh, what happened actually Like when I grew, when I got older, it just stopped? As you grow older, kids tend to grow out of this. Okay. Why so? Like what uh, because because the angiogenesis it tends to regress a little bit. But I, but there are also adults who continue to have nosebleeds into adulthood. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that if you have a nosebleed as a child, you don't need to treat it? Uh, it depends. If you have nosebleeds once a year, then you probably can just avoid. Uh, you can yeah. just ignore it. But I would still say check to make sure what the cause is first before you decide whether you want to treat it or not. But if you are bleeding every two days, then you really need to do something about it. You can't. What do you mean by treat it? Uh, what sort of treatment can be done if they uh, are Mainly bleeding? cauterization. If indeed the cause is the small vessel at your bone, yeah. uh, basically we need to cauterize the blood vessel and that usually is the end of it. Lah. What is that process like? We can do two things. We have electrocautery, which is yeah. a, a, a probe that we use to burn the vessel. Mm. Oh, you just burn it and then it removes? It uh, removes. Then the vessel just dies off. Uh. Or we can use a liquid, a certain type of acid that we apply at that uh. area that also does the same thing. So it's actually not the most uh, complicated surgery. No, no, very, very simple. simple. Very simple. Uh, in an adult, we can use, do it in a clinic setting. We can just do it in a clinic mm. when they are awake. Um, in a bigger child, we can do that as well. Um, but in a smaller child, we usually have to put them to sleep for a while. Okay, because uh. of just the pain? Or? No, they, they just wouldn't cooperate lah. Okay. Some some children only <laughs> even let you look at the nose like alone and yeah, do yeah, anything because yeah. it does sting a little bit. Yes. When your nose bleed, right? What are you supposed to do? People often just stuck a stuff uh, that, a tissue. That's up. the the most common mistake is actually uh, putting your head up this yeah. way because what happens is that the blood will then flow to the back of your throat. Then you end up swallowing blood. Yeah. Uh, if you're unlucky, it gets into your lungs and things like that. That's bad, lah. So what must what you need to do is actually. Get your head down and pinch your nose, yeah. the soft bit here, not the bone bit, soft bit. Yeah. And then get some uh, an ice cube if you have access to some. Yeah. Just put inside your mouth and let it melt inside your mouth while you're pinching your nose. What is the ice for? Uh, just to when when it's cold, <coughs> your your blood vessels contract, so it reduces the bleed. If you have somebody to help you, put some ice, into, uh, some uh, plastic bag, put it on your forehead. So on the forehead, pinch your nose inside your mouth until it stops lah. That usually will stop most of it within a couple of minutes. 
when I was younger, right, I would sleep in the every night in an air conditioned room. I would get nose blocks very bad. Mm. And I just don't get them anymore, you know. It's Can, uh, sensitivities and allergies tend to become less irritating as you go on. As you Why? Go. Because your Because your body just gets used to it after a while. Okay, I, I remember mm. it was I still remember there were a lot of nights where it's so hard for me to fall asleep because you know mm. the worst is when both both Your noses nose block, yeah. starts to get blocked and you know somehow you, you just I still fall as, asleep mm. uh, then I would, open your mouth and breathe your mouth. yeah, yeah. Right, to open yeah. your mouth and breathe yeah. and you know you have this fear in your head where you think that oh what if I fall asleep and I don't open my mouth and then I'll die <laughs> no your body has a defense mechanism yeah um, if say you have uh, you have a condition called sleep apnea which you can talk about I, I'm going uh, to talk so about it yeah this condition is where you actually choke in your sleep. Yeah. Uh, you stop breathing. Yeah. Uh, so what happens is when you have these episodes, the oxygen in your blood tends to get lower because you're choking. And your brain detects this, uh, that your oxygen level is getting lower. And, yeah. it actually, it, and it thinks that you're going to die. So it actually wakes you up. What exactly is sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is very much related to snoring. Yes. Okay. And when you talk about snoring, there's two types of snoring. There are people who snore sometimes. This is normal. What we call habitual snorer. People who snore all the time. Hmm. Uh, this is not normal. Okay, so people who snore all the time hmm. tend to also have s- at least some degree of sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is basically, like I said, uh, you stop breathing in your sleep. Why do those people stop breathing in their sleep? Um, okay, <coughs> when you snore, you say, say, yeah, yeah. What what that is actually vibration in your palate. Yes. Uh, okay. So. Is it like something is stuck? It, it kind of ah, seems like a, something is you stuck. Get, you get this vibration because your airway is partially blocked. Okay. Not completely blocked, partially blocked. Yes. But people who sleep apnea, at some point, it becomes completely blocked. You can. And then they just. Then they have to wake up. Ah, they, they choke, they choke, they choke until the oxygen level goes down and the body wakes you up. It wakes, you, it yeah. wakes you up but then the cycle continues you wake up and then you start snoring again and stop breathing again it keeps on repeating 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 yeah your body wakes you up so that you will breathe through your mouth huh? yeah. is it basically yeah. is it true that if you are more overweight or obese you absolutely. are more likely more likely to get absolutely, it absolutely 100% uh, why so because people who are obese have more tissue inside the throat to get their airways blocked the yeah. tissue is like fat huh, also yes that, there are a lot of redundant tissues in the throat. Their palate <coughs> tends to be more broad. Their tonsils tend to be bigger. Their uvula, which is your dangling thing in the, yeah. the throat, tends to be longer. Oh, this oh, it's called the ovula. Yeah. yeah. So obese people, 100% will get more 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 chances of getting uh, sleep. But more fat, you get yeah. more redundant tissue in your throat. So more tissue, more lots more tissue in your throat, the yeah. chances of you choking is higher. But when you when you talk about tissue, are you talking you're talking about the side on the walls, is it of the walls yeah, of your no, throat? The side of the walls is your tonsils. Yeah. The middle of your throat is your palate. Yeah. All of these are a lot more in fatter people. So, uh. Can you actually be born with sleep apnea? If you have condi- congenital conditions, yes. Some people with, uh, with, who are born with birth defects, for example, some some children are born with very small jaw. Mm. So so much so that the tongue keeps on flopping to the back of the throat and they keep on choking all the time. Okay. But these are Very rare. these are these are abnormalities lah. Yeah. Uh, but if a person is born normal, generally you don't get sleep apnea unless you have huge tonsils, which some children some some children have. Why do people when they're younger they don't have sleep apnea? Then when they get older they they get they suddenly get sleep apnea. Like let's say if they they didn't become overweight or obese. Uh Normally, when you're young, if you're not obese, mm. uh, you, you have to look at it. If you also have big tonsils, then you can get sleep apnea. But you yeah. have normal tonsils, yeah. and you're not uh, you're not fat. Yeah. Uh, there are other factors. Some people have smaller jaws. Uh, may not necessarily be you know pathologically small, but a lot of people you see if they close their mouth, their their the the teeth at the top is so much more advanced compared to the jaw. So they've got small jaws. When you have small jaws, your tongue tends to flop back when you sleep. It's a problem in the bone, in the jaw structure. Yeah, in the jaw structure. Yeah, that one can give you sleep apnea. The other thing is big tonsils. Yeah. But other than that, it's mostly uh, related to weight gain. A lot of people when okay. they when they get married and they put on weight, yes. they start having uh, they start having uh, sleep apnea lah. 
the other thing that's possible is as you age as you become older your tissues in your throat become more floppy less turgor like skin Oh, okay. Like, like saggy. Old people's skin, uh, you know, is basically you pinch it and it doesn't go back. Uh-huh. So it becomes very saggy. That happens in your throat as well. Oh, okay. Like my my father has sleep apnea. He's very thin. It's because of like like you said, uh, the oh. skin becomes floppy. Yeah. Yeah. People commonly when they get older, they have sleep apnea because of the lifestyle, right? Because people gain weight. Yeah. Tend to gain it's weight. It's a lot of it is related to weight gain. Yes. When you have sleep apnea, they use those. Uh, what do you call it? Like the ventilation. Is it, is uh, we have oxygen? what's called CPAP machine we call it uh, yeah. this are, uh, stands for continuous positive airways pressure yeah. so basically it's a gas machine that mm. pushes air into your throat so what? So when you breathe in mm. it forces air in to overcome whatever obstruction that you have in your throat to deliver the air that you need Okay. Uh, so this is the sort of gold standard treatment mm. this is the most effective treatment Not necessarily the most convenient, but the most effective. But would you call it a treatment since it's kind of like... Is it a treatment? Yeah. It, okay, but does it help the patient once he, he gets off of it, he stops using it? Uh, no, you know he needs I mean? to be on it. Uh, When they sleep? Uh? Yes. At least five nights a week. Okay, but wh- why would you call it a, a treatment if it doesn't like solve the problem? Uh, you, know? you want to solve the, the, the source of the problem, mm-hmm. you need to get the weight down. Exactly. Uh, That's get, the only way. Uh, uh, get the weight right. down. If you have big tonsils, you need to remove your tonsils. Yeah. Um, all these things. But to get your weight down it takes time. The yes. fastest way is to do bariatric surgery. Then you can get your weight to drop down drastically in just a space of uh, two three months. Can you? Can uh, is there cases of people who they have very bad sleep apnea and they choke or what when they sleep and then yes, they, you can, they can choke and die. That's possible. Um, Not common, but you yeah. can. Yeah, okay. Most of the time, the body will wake you up. A lot of people tend to dismiss this snoring and sleep apnea. A lot of people don't even know they have sleep apnea. When you ask their wives, they say, oh, my husband are really choked in their sleep. It's quite scary. Oh. You know, uh, usually the wives that tell you, you better go and see someone. Lah. You know, Because you snore, it's not a problem for you. It's a problem for, yeah, for uh, your spouse. There's a lot of people that <laughs> snore that don't realize they snore. But. Because you, you can't really hear you snore. Yeah, uh, uh, unless you you wake yourself up snoring. Then, uh, <laughs> it's possible... The problem with sleep apnea is it, uh, it increases your risk of strokes, heart disease, high blood pressure, all these things. Um, so it's something not you can just brush aside. The those who are habitual snorers who don't have sleep apnea, yeah, yeah. is again is is related to either your jaw structure, your yeah, face yeah. structure, or your uh, tissues because of weight gain. Okay. Uh, some people they, have, they just snore but they don't really have significant apnea. The treatment is slightly different. Because if in this in these patients they don't really need that CPAP machine. Yeah. The CPAP machine is only for those who very bad sleep apnea. Yeah. For those people, especially who are younger, we recommend throat surgery lah. Because throat surgery is the only thing that can actually reduce the snoring. Ah, uh, so why is it sleep apnea? You won't snore while you're in the CPAP machine, but as soon as you take it off, <laughs> snore again. Why do those people actually snore occasionally? Like let's say once or twice. Sometimes a month. when you're extremely tired, or if you if uh. you drink alcohol, sometimes you snore whenever you have a a binge at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but only on those occasions. But otherwise, you're okay. But what actually happens? Ah, uh? uh, then you when you when you are extra tired and your tissues then become your muscles tend to relax a lot more and your tissues become a lot more floppy when you sleep. So you tend okay. to snore. Oh, definitely. So why? The 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 next thing as well is why don't we snore when we are not asleep? Because your tissues are still there. What happens is that because your your palates have muscles in them, so when you are awake, those muscles tense up a bit, so they become less floppy. But when you sleep, your muscles relax, your palate becomes floppy, and you also breathe a lot deeper, so you get that that vibration sound I definitely notice when after drink we'll sleep I mean we'll, we'll snore a lot of people so like that what is tonsils actually? tonsils are basically tissues at the uh, oral pharynx at the side of your of your oral cavity yeah which are present in everyone uh, yeah. with varying sizes yeah there's another tissue we call adenoids which are similar to tonsils but they are at the back of the nose okay okay Tonsils and adenoids are thought to have a role in the immune system, lah. Okay, but they are not essential organs. Of, you know, what is the role? The uh, they they produce uh, certain types of antibodies, <laughs> which which help which help in the immune system, uh. Uh, which is also a cause uh, of some parents being very reluctant to have their tonsils removed in a child. Mm. 
And this one is I I uh, we we really want to educate them that if the tonsils are causing problems, i.e. Uh, recurrent fevers mm -hmm. or sleep apnea or very bad snoring, then you need these tonsils and the noise to be removed. Studies have shown we've removed millions of tonsils throughout the years all over yeah. the world. There's never been any problem. Studies have shown that whatever deficit that you may get in terms yeah. of your uh, immune ability with the tonsils mm -hmm. and noise removed will be recovered within two or three months. Is it, would you say very similar to like people removing the um, the appendix? Appendix got no rule. Appendix not is that uh, one is diff even yeah. More appendix is, is ba basically a useless organ. Uh, is uh, it doesn't need to be there at all. Okay. So. Why some people have to remove their tonsils and why why some people don't? De depends on the indication. Mm. Uh, the first indication that we we look for when we are considering to remove tonsils is is the uh, frequency of fevers and sore throat. How come it's related? Uh, of course, tonsils tend to get infected quite easily. So you can get inflammation of tonsils, you get fever and sore throat. The general rule is that we, if you have more than five or six episodes in a year, then we, re we recommend you to remove. What happens? Well, what do you mean by episodes? I, I've never gotten uh, Oh, you tonsillitis. never got tonsillitis before? Never. Oh, uh, right. uh, okay, how many percent of people would have would get it? Uh, tonsillitis are quite common. Yeah. Uh, in children... I would say the majority of children would have uh, an episode of tonsillitis at some point in their life. La. Yeah, also. I'm the one that uh, uh, never got it. So I have no idea how... I, 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 I also personally, I can't remember the last uh, last time I got tonsillitis if ever. But my children have had, but only a couple of times. Uh, so if it's infrequent, generally we don't do anything but we just treat the infection and, uh, and that, that's it. What, what happens when you get it? It just hurts? Is it? Sore throat. La. Sore throat. Fever, difficulty uh, eating. Uh, um, and it hurts... More, I, I mean, this is what I, I heard. I heard it's more than a normal sore throat, is it? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh -huh. The kind of normal sore throat, when you have a cold, when you're yeah. about to start to have a cold, a viral infection, you start with a sore throat first. And then your, sto uh, your nose will start to run afterwards. That's very mild. The tonsillitis sore throat is really bad when you are actually struggling to eat. What happens if you don't get it taken care of? Just let it leave it over there. Um. Then you keep on getting the fevers and so through. But it will. You will also recover and then you'll come back. Is it? So there's probably um some people so that they they just bear through the pain and then they've had it for, I don't know. It comes every every year or so. They but don't. But I like say if it's once or twice a year, maybe you just leave it be. But if it's like every month you're getting a sore throat and then there's no point keeping the tonsil. There is no point actually, right, in keeping the tonsils because your body if it's, can function. Yeah, if fine. it's causing problems, there's no point. But if it's not causing you problems, then just leave it. For no surgery, right? Mm. Do you have any experience doing? Well, for no surgery, uh, in the sense of removing lesions in the vocal cord, yes. Oh, uh, sorry, altering voice, no. We generally don't do that sort of thing in Malaysia, lah. Um, just just uh, explain uh, what exactly is uh, for no surgery. For no surgery is basically uh, any surgery to do with the vocal cord. Mm. For your case? Uh, generally, we do cysts, um, yeah. we do polyps, uh, nodules, those kind of things. These are actual pathologies la, when there's actually something wrong with, yeah, your, yeah. Wo with your vocal cord. I've always been interested to know, right? Like, I know how some people who, let's say they're a transgender female, mm -hmm. right? They go through surgery to make their voice change to sound like a female, right? From a, from a man. How does that actually work? Or do you have um, any idea? I can't claim to be an expert on that, but from what I gather is a lot of these transgender, I mean male to female, yeah. they can actually train their vocal cords to speak more like a woman. Um, oh, it's not actually... You can't actually go through... Is, you is can. It uh, there, there's, there are some surgeons in, in Japan, for example, yeah. who actually tighten the cords. They make yeah. it a little shorter to make it tense up a little bit mm. to give you a higher pitch voice. Uh, but... I think most trans transgender people tend to train themselves to okay. talk. And they can, some of them can sound quite convincing actually. Uh, by simply, simply by training themselves. Like, I mean, popular one uh, is uh, uh, Sajad. Oh, so, she, she definitely didn't have any voice. Yeah, yeah, the one she, so that's why, <laughs> that's why I'm wondering, I thought she would have probably have done so, you know, if she could, but is it a very risky um, surgery or whatever, if you would know? Yeah, vo vocal cords is, is, vocal cords is quite, uh, quite a delicate organ. Mm. Um, there, are, there are some risks associated with it, you know. Mm. If you mess around with the vocal cords, it can scar, and then you can get a hoarse voice, which, is, which yeah, defeats the purpose. Yeah. Uh, so, 
I think very few people actually do these sort of surgeries. Uh-huh. Uh, certainly none in, the, in in Malaysia that I know. Okay, so like like you mentioned, they mm. they tighten it up so that your mm. pitch goes higher. Goes higher, yes. Okay, uh, but of of course you still have to train to talk like uh, mm. the female like, if you if you want to. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, no, I've always been curious because mm. I I always wonder how how do you work? Can you actually do something to alter? Your voice, you know, the change. Uh, no, you can you can tighten the vocal cords, lah. Uh, but yeah, in Malaysia, they don't do all this stuff. Don't do this, I think. Why do people get phlegm? Phlegm is basically um, secretions of mucus that accumulates in your throat. Mm-hmm. Okay, it can come from two sources. Either it comes from usually it comes from the nose. You tend to get phlegm in the morning if it comes from the nose because it, accumul- uh, it flows from the back of your nose to your throat. Then it sort of thickens overnight and you get some phlegm. Or you can get phlegm that comes from, actually comes from your stomach because of acid reflux. Mm. That tends to happen after food and also at night time. Yeah, um, I definitely notice after you mm. eat, eat food, mm-hmm. you're definitely going to get a lot of phlegm. Mm. I, I remember there was one time, you know, I was getting a lot of phlegm. I was sick, like having nose blocks and all. Mm. Then I tried to Google how to mm. make it better, you know, find mm. a solution mm. for it. And they, they recommend drink warm water can you actually like do something to reduce all the phlegm apart it, from immediate relief only um, you have to get to the source mm. uh, like I said phlegm can come from your nose or from your stomach Yeah. if you're having a cold and you got a phlegm mm. uh, then most likely it's coming from your nose so you need to treat your nose as you dry out your nose then the phlegm will reduce okay the warm water does help because um, cold drinks tend to trigger more nasal secretions compared to warm water Okay, so that that's the reason why warm water would be a, a better solution. Why do smokers get a lot of phlegm? Oh, because um, what smoking does to the lining of your airway, eh? mm. we're talking lining of your airway, your nose, your throat, yeah. and also your lungs. When in the lining of your airway, we have small hairs, microscopic hairs that we call cilia. Yeah. So these hairs, the function is basically to sweep the mucus, Yep. and the uh, mucus and the secretions from your nose to your airways into your stomach so that you swallow it. That's from the top. From the bottom, it goes up the other way and also into your stomach. Uh, sorry, so sorry, say that last part again. So, the, the, the hairs in the lining of your airway yeah. sweeps the secretions and the mucus downwards yeah. towards your uh, esophagus so that you, yeah. you swallow it. And from your lungs, it goes upwards Yeah. Into your esophagus as well, the other way around. Yeah, yeah. So it brings phlegm upwards. Yeah. Okay. What happens with people who smoke, yes. the, the smoke paralyzes the cilia. So the hairs don't work. So the mucus then becomes static. Yeah. Uh, so those secretions in your lungs don't actually come up. It uh-huh. stays in your lungs. So that's why you get all this cough and phlegm. So it clogs. It kind yeah, of help. it, it, it clogs. clogs. Uh, that's why you get a lot of cough, especially in the morning. And... Another thing that's uh, associated with this. Why, why in the morning? Huh? Why? Because uh, like after. Uh, because yeah. it accumulates. It accumulates after you sleep. Uh, uh, because uh, during the day, sometimes you cough. During the day, it moves the phlegm up because of the cough. Uh-uh. Uh, but in uh, during the night, you don't really cough very much. So it tends to accumulate accumulates in your lung. And also, uh, another thing that I want to point, point out, when, when the mucus doesn't move because of the uh, cilia not moving, mm. so whatever toxins and dirt that is stuck with the with the mucus yeah. tends to stay there and that irritates the lining underneath and that over time can cause things like cancer and things like that because you get this constant irritation so, as long as you are an active smoker right the your cilia or they are not able to function no, they don't it? function very well no. okay um, and of course the longer longer you do the it the longer you do it the more constant irritation your lining gets that, that gives rise to your lung cancers your throat cancers your everything that's there um, I think it's a very interesting topic like, to talk about Um, because nowadays right, we see the rise of a so-called alternative to smoking mm. which is vaping mm. right but many of course a lot, of, a lot of people have already come out and said that it's even worse than than smoking, and then there's also e-cigarettes, mm-hmm. uh, right? Yeah. Well, what's your take on it, uh, And how it's well, actually different? I get quite a lot of questions on this, but the truth is, mm. we won't. Uh, vape is something quite quite recent, right? Ten years. Ten years. Last, I'm is it ten less, years? Less it's been it's been as long as that. I think even more recent. If uh more common, I think is five, six, seven uh, years. Uh, 
on the face of it, it looks like a better idea than smoking. On the face of it lah. But you never really know until you have a, a data of at least 10 to 15 years down the line. There was a time, uh, you know, in the 60s where smoking is, is the thing. In fact, there were some people who said smoking is good for you. So everyone <laughs> was smoking. It was only in the mid-70s that we were like, oh dear, you know, all the problems then only. So we, we won't really know until at least another ten five, years, ten years, right? five, ten years down the line. I suspect there will be some issues with it. Lah. But you said that it on the surface it looks better, right? I think simply because it doesn't require you to burn it up, but right? And, and uh, inhale it. Tobacco and things like that. Lah. Yeah. yeah. But what people people say it's actually worse because of what's actually inside the chemicals that they use um i thought it was just flavorings normally Th- do you think it's worse or you you yourself like you have um, no idea i i can't say whether it's worse or not but on the face of it it looks like a, a slightly better idea than smoking at the moment lah. better if you avoid both of them lah, but when you when you artificially inhale things you know there will always be some chronic irritation in the lining of your lungs that will eventually cause problems uh. I mm. I have a friend that went to the um, doctor la, so mm. he smoked cigarettes and he mm. smoked vape as well mm. both oh, both yeah so the doctor told him the doctor actually told him because uh, I think his lungs collapsed oh yeah the doctor actually told him that it's the vape the vape because they found a lot of um, uh, water like mm. water vapors and all mm. in mm. his lungs what, what actually happens uh, like how come there's water vapors and all like I said when, when you irritate the lining of your lungs mm. with something like, like the water vape or certain chemicals that are inside the vape they tend, the lungs tend to the lining tends to produce mucus when you produce mucus those, you see in your lungs you got your bron- uh, bronchus and you got smaller branches yeah, yeah. and even smaller branches that goes down yeah, yeah. those small small branches at the end tend to get clogged up very easily with mucus so when it clogs up enough, then you get what we call lung collapse. The the water vapors are the mucus, is it? No, the wa- water vapors get into the lung. It irritates the lining of yeah. your lungs. That then produces. This mucus. water vapor is actually the vape juice, ah, is it? The whatever they put inside there, lah. The whatever chemicals they put inside there. That's why I say when you inhale artificial stuff in your lungs it uh. tends to irritate the lining as, uh, in some way and that produces mucus so w- would you say that let's say if you're someone who's never vaped before and then you vape initially your body is able to kind of absorb and deal with the uh, the the juice uh, then after a while it's, it gets clogged up that's why you see it yeah and uh, if you irritate and inflame uh, the lining of your mm. mucosa we call it uh, lining yeah. of your lungs eventually it will produce some kind of reaction and the, the usual reaction is uh, production of mucus I, I, okay I remember that particular case also right um, the friend said that the doctor told him if you had if you cannot stop both if you had to pick one stop the vape that's that's what the doctor said uh, which is I'm not sure what he's basing that on. Uh, yeah. I think we need b- maybe more data to come up with that conclusion. La. But I suspect both of them are no good. La. Not suspect, it's kind of most yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, wh- what about um, e-cigarette? Uh? Do you know much about that? Like, what's the deep? No, I don't know much. What, what does he do? I also don't even... I, also, I thought you would know. <laughs> no, no. No, I, I, I wouldn't know. I think... Do you light it? Light it? I don't even... I don't think you light it up. Uh. Do you I don't think it involves any kind of fire. Just Okay, so it's electric. They're not actually using a uh, fire. I, I can't give you an intelligent answer on that because I really don't know how it works. Everyone. Okay, uh, doctor, how important is it for us to clean our nose and ears regularly? And uh, how do you advise on going about okay, that? Okay, uh, we'll talk about the ears first. Um, physiologically, what, what normally happens is that the ear cleans itself. Yes. Okay. What it does is um, the wax uh, is actually produced at the outside of your ear canal. So it doesn't produce inside your ear canal. It produces outside. If you look at in your ear canal, if you can see, yeah. uh, the opening of your ear canal has a lot of hair. Yes. Uh, that's when that's where the wax is produced. The things that come from inside is actually old skin. It actually migrates to the front of the uh, from the back of your ear canal to the front. It mixes with the wax and mm. becomes kind of like a boulder, and it just pops out. Okay. That's how it's, uh, it normally works. So, with that respect, the ear doesn't need cleaning. It cleans itself. However, yes. however, there are certain people who produce excessive amount of wax. Yes. There are people with whose canals are very narrow. Yeah. Okay. And there are also people who have very dry skin. 
so much so that the wax gets clogged inside. I saw a video that you you posted. You're talking about um, you actually need your earwax, the earwax in your ear that you um accumulate. It's actually important. The earwax has some antiseptic properties. It actually prevents infection. Uh huh. Okay, but like I said, you don't actually need to clean the earwax. It comes up by itself. Cases where people get earwax clogged up, even if they don't uh, dig their ears. Yeah. In those kind of cases, you do two things. One, one you try and get some ear drops from the pharmacy yeah. to try and soften the wax. If you are lucky, the wax will just flow out. If you are not so lucky, then uh. see your ENT doctor and let us clean it, not you. These people, like most of the the time, was the reason why they have like ex- uh, excessive. Uh, it's just one of those things. Some people just produce a lot. I'm one of those. Those people will produce a lot of Is wax. it because of sweat? Sweating too much? No, no. It's just one of those people. Uh, it's, it's, uh, some people just produce a lot of serum for, for some reason. There's, uh, there's, there's no real explanation for it. But a lot, if you see, a lot, if you look into the ears of everyone, mm. most of them are very clean. Even if they never dig their ears. And that's how, that's how it's supposed to be. But I'm one of those who produce a lot of wax. So every, say, four months or so, mm. I'll just get one of my colleagues to clean my ears. But I never dig my ears. You get them to clean, but you're not talking about using a. Is it like, oh, okay. no, no cotton bud. I okay. mean, we have microscopes and scopes and uh, things to 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 flush out the, flush out the earwax if it can be flushed out or we need to do some suction depending. Um, not all earwax are the same. Some are harder than others. Some are semi liquid. Uh, all these things require various techniques. So, it would be wrong to say oh, it's one. Uh, one yeah, solution for, technique for everything yeah. and I, I also do I also very discourage uh, GPs from attempting to 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 wash the ear lah, because a lot of times they end up damage, damaging the ear but how would they wash the ear the GPs some of them use water which like is not like a water pressure, uh, water sometimes pressure sometimes you just use some a bit of syringe sometimes you buy something from Lazada or something uh. that can flush that can work uh, yeah. a lot of the times but not all the time and you need to have the proper technique to use that as well what about those candle wax? That one, I, I, I really... What is that? Oh, sorry. I, I really don't understand why we do it. Uh, I've seen videos of it. Mm. Apparently, the, the, the air or the smoke from the candle wax creates some kind of a vacuum that sort of sucks the uh, ear wax out. Mm. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Does it work? I've seen videos where they claim it works, but... No, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it I think that like I said I I wouldn't encourage GPs to, to watch it. just send yeah, it to yeah. us just just let us do because we have we have all the scopes and the equipment we show there's no yeah. damage and things like that I mean the if you see one of the latest videos that I posted uh-huh. uh, on this boy basically has been digging his ears so a little bit of the wax goes in goes in goes in all the he, time he dig with what his cotton finger bud, or cotton yeah so I wanted to ask about yeah, using a cotton bud but like how how do you go about using that? It can be dangerous as well if you use it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at logically, uh, the cotton part, the shape is round, you know. Exactly. How can you possibly dig, dig all the wax out, out when it's round? It's not possible. Unless the wax so, uh, sticks some, uh, <laughs> some of it will come out, some of it will go in, some of it will come out, some of it will go in. And worse, if you, some people use sticks and metal rods, you know, that is even more dangerous so because... There's this... Um, there's this um, the earwax cleaner it's kind of like a small little shovel very tiny thin shovel is that okay? or is that that is the best option if you do it yourself? Is it's it? a, a shovel if you can actually see exactly what you're doing yeah. most people just dig buta buta only that's yeah. dangerous because the, your, the skin of your ear canal is very thin oh. very easily traumatised if you get infection in the skin and it swells up, it's very, very... That's why it hurts also lah once yeah. you... When and you then do it. also the cotton bud, I know it's white, but it doesn't mean it's clean. You know? there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fungus in there. Yeah, yeah. And I can tell you from experience, you get, you get a fungal infection in the ear, very difficult to treat. Advice for someone who has no issues with hearing or does not have any like uh, excessive ear clock, right? They just don't clean their just ears. Just leave it. Just leave it. Okay. Unless you really see the thing right outside there, uh, you just can, leave. Uh, then you can just leave it. But don't shove the thing in. Like oh dear! All my, all the, a lot of um, Asian parents are yeah. giving wrong advice all the time. 
Why sometimes it, sometimes the, the ear is a bit itchy. Yeah. So they like to do it because it relieves the itch. They get, they get to scratch the ear. Exactly. So not not, 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 not was, a good idea. Huh? When I was younger, my mom would make it a point, you know, all three of us, I every was. week she will help us clean uh, once. Oh, my wife loves to clean my ear. I say no more. Already. But it's not... <laughs> she, she likes to do it. But, but basically... <laughs> Like you mentioned, if you don't have any problems, just don't just leave it. Just leave it. So mom was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I saw something very ridiculous. Uh, oh my god, that's just it's just horrible to think about. Uh, this this one of your patient actually had an insect in the ear. Oh yeah, it's more common than you think. But I saw the size of the insect. It was. Oh, big. I've seen cockroaches inside. It's, yeah, 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 the cockroach. Yeah. It was. It looks like it's bigger than the ear hole. How do you go inside? Or why? It can't be bigger, lah. Yeah. But it's usually not the adult cockroach. It's usually the baby cockroach. And then they like grow inside. Like, uh, they they can be they can be there long enough to actually grow. Uh, no, actually, um, got eggs and cocoons. That inside. that is must be um can be very dangerous, right? Yeah, you have to clean it, lah. Definitely. So, but do you, normally people who get insects and stuff in their ears. Another more very common thing is the hawk lice. Hog lice. Ah, your kutu wabi, we call Must it. be very tiny. Yeah, ah, that one is very okay. painful because the the hog lice tends to tends it has claws and it, it digs into your skin or your canal. That's extremely painful. They how do they they just come? How do they come? Uh, but normally like these that? people, they these are the people who go camping outside. Uh, in the because jungle. Because hog lice comes from from animals, you know. Oh, uh, okay. Somehow it creeps. Um, some. Animals like dogs and things like that and have a lot yeah. of hog lice in the in the ear. So this time, uh, some of these can get into the human ear as well. They suck the blood from your ear canal. What what happens if it's if it stays inside there and you don't get it removed? Well, it starts to feces. Uh, it starts to defecate. You get a lot of feces reduce. inside, and then because of the claws, and then you can get infection. Eventually, it will. Become but you an you won't be able to leave it alone. It's too painful. You I see. Uh, let's say like. Not a hog lice like a like a like a cockroach uh, that goes inside the ear. What happens? Can the cockroach live? That's what I'm th- thinking. Can the cockroach survive? Oh, it, it can unless it unless it suffocates uh, for some reason. It can. Uh. It can survive because it's just eating your earwax, is it? Or it, it won't. It won't be there for weeks, <laughs> lah. Be By the time it gets there, you're already. I mean, you're oh, already you can, in such you discomfort. It, uh. You're already. Uh, so what what we normally do we need to kill it first so we need to suffocate it first lah with some gel or uh, some liquid then we fish it out. You say it's actually more common than people think. Uh, well, I can't imagine. I would assume it's a very horrible feeling. Uh. I had uh, quite a few cockroaches. Hog lice quite a lot. Ah, oh uh, my god! And then often when you see those and sometimes um, do those patients do they call in first or they just show up and then they. Oh no! They usually go. They usually go to the emergency lah. Normally, but they they might end up to the GP as well. But the GP will send send them to the hospital. They they should be in panic, is it? Most of the time. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Things oh moving dear. in your ear. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. Do do you get uh, in insects or whatever going up your peep your nose? Nose rarely lah. Ear. Yeah. Because nose it ends up in your in your your throat. Uh, uh. Can uh, but foreign bodies in the nose rarely end up all the way down lah. Uh. In theory, it can uh, but usually get stuck in your nose there. Eh. Do you have any um, find any weird things stuck in people's ears, uh, other than um, insects? Children are normally um, beads, um, oh all sorts of things. Because you, between the age and three, between the ages of three and five, uh-huh. children they they start to develop their pincer grip, and that's uh-huh. when they start putting things instead of orifices, lah. Okay. Of course, they put things in their mouth. That's quite yeah. common. But they also put things in their nose and their ears. Okay. <laughs> nose more often than not, the ears usually. Their friend or something like that will put inside the ear. So we often hear that um, it just can't be good for you to always have earphones in your ear, you know, mm. ear- AirPods. Of uh, course, yeah. Why is the reason what happens when you have it? In because your ear? The, you, you tend to uh, uh, you tend to jack up the volume more than you need to. Between earphones mm. and headphones, headphones are a little better. Headphones as in not the Cover fitting the ones. Ear. Yeah, the the beats, the beats headphones, those ah, big headsets. Ah, uh, something like that is better than putting your your AirPod. Because simply because um, if it's an AirPod, it's more direct the sound and it's higher volume. Is it? No, because when you have headphones, right, when you cover the ear, mm. your volume doesn't need to be that high for you to appreciate the sound because it's covered. Mm. 
But when you put your earphone, there's a lot of ambient noise around. So you tend to jack up the volume even more just so that... You, just so you can so cancel out the noise. Yeah, out, so, you can so that's bad. Oh, so like, mm. there are big headphones with noise cancellation. Have you tried those before? Like no, those, I haven't. Just headphones, uh. um, the good ones, they'll have good noise cancellation now, so you really can't hear anything um, yeah. anything else. That's better. Then uh, you, you filter out all the ambient noise so you don't have to listen at a very high, uh, too high a volume. Generally you shouldn't put the volume up more than 50%. The reason why it's bad is... Mm. Noise trauma. What happens if you are not listening to it at a very high volume? Is that okay? Only as a certain number of hours a day only. Yeah. But, but less than 50, 50, uh, less than 50%. So even if it's less than, um, at an okay volume, why is it bad to listen to it in a long time? Because, uh, because you, get, uh, you get noise trauma. Eventually you will end up with what we call noise-induced hearing loss. Okay, uh, because um, because of the noise trauma, then your the hair cells in your ear canal will get damaged at some point. So at a certain frequency in your hearing, it will start to drop. So uh, you you basically become slowly become deaf. Deaf. And deaf. Yes, yes. This is especially common with club workers, you know, yeah, night, yeah. night club workers, where they are constantly or noisy factory workers. Yeah. When people mm. say they have their ear drums popped, right? Mm. Is it like? the noise is too loud that it explodes? Yeah, it's possible. But usually the eardrum perforation happens because of in infections or trauma. Lah. You shove something in, like kids, you shove some pencil inside the ear or something like that. You, you ever have patients come in, like, you know, they they um, ex like heard a very loud noise, maybe a gunshot or like something exploding that it popped or what? Did you, did you have, uh, have um, you? It's definitely possible. Mm. I haven't seen one myself yet. Mm. Um, but those who come in because of uh, trauma, because they put something in their ear and the mm. eardrum gets perforated, that's quite common. You, but the most common is infection. Infections, are okay. But you said also just now you had, um, uh, let's say those people work in the nightclubs. Or but that, that kind of sound, not to the point where the eardrum burst la. it just ear, hearing level goes down yeah and down. that's long term ear, uh, noise trauma la. and you, can you do anything to to make it better or is there a Which solution one? to that let's say if um, you've gone 10% deaf yeah, the normal because of say noise induced hearing loss that's yes. permanent permanent you can never you get cannot it. do anything about it because your nerve is already damaged is there any sort of uh, I'm not aware of this at all any sort of like ear transplants or what for people who are deaf does no, hearing aid is the answer. Ah, okay. Hearing aid. Yeah. How does that work? Hearing aid. Basically, like hearing aid is something that just amplifies the sound that comes in. It makes it louder to the point where you can hear. So if you're hearing 50%, it makes uh, you hear 100%. You, you jack it up. Uh, you jack it up to the point where you can hear. Is there any, um, mm, like, any downsides to using a hearing aid? It seems like very... The downside very is, very number one, is the inconvenience of having something in your ear. Mm. Some people don't like the stigma. If you have a hearing aid, yeah. they say, oh, it's, you're like old or deaf or something yeah. like that. There are other options where you have a hearing aid that actually goes in inside mm -hmm. so you don't see anything in the back of the, of the ear. Okay. Um, but to your knowledge, there's no... Um, is there any bad like long-term uh, Physiological damage, no. Um, but you do need to tune your hearing aid every now and again mm -hmm. because these are usually for elderly people. Lah. Mm. Because as you get older, your hearing will get worse and worse. So eventually, you need to tune it to to the point where you know it's it's workable for you. I I was wondering right because, Bluetooth like people use AirPods right. AirPods are often connected to Bluetooth or even Wi-Fi right. Mm. Um, do you have any knowledge on how that would affect? Because you know, some some people say like just Wi-Fi itself is very bad. Mm, I I wouldn't know anything about that one. Mm. I don't know. For just for for me, just because mm. I I wear AirPods, mm. right? Um, when I'm in the gym, I just feel like because you are connected to your Bluetooth, you are connected to your mm. Wi-Fi, mm. can't be, you know, good for you if you use it all the time. Huh? I think uh, <coughs> anything that is used being used as excessively will have some some kind of uh, negative impact at some point. Mm. I think anything used. Anything that you use moderately or you eat moderately yeah. is is okay. Anything done excessively is never good. Vertigo. What mm. what actually happens when people experience vertigo? Vertigo again when um, when people come to my clinic, they always always say, "Oh, doctor, um, rasa pening, mm. pening is that." But I always ask them what you mean by pening mm. because some people 
say headache sah pening. Mm. So it's different. Headache, pening is dizziness. Headache is sakit kepala lah. Yeah. So when we talk about vertigo again, you have to differentiate what you mean, because vertigo is basically the sensation of imbalance or things spinning around you. Mm. So that's specifically vertigo. Yeah. Some people uh, think they are having vertigo, but what they are actually having is a faint where they are about to pass out. Yeah, yeah. Because you often feel like you're having a vertigo before you faint, ah. Uh, sometimes you yeah. feel a bit embarrassed, but faint is when you are, you feel as if you are going to pass out. Vertigo yeah. is as if you're on a on a ship, you're going around. Like Faint, fainting is sort of. Are you talking about like it starts blinking the uh, white get, color? Ah, you, uh, you get white, then you get a little bit sweaty. Ah, uh, uh, that that's that's what we call faint or we call syncope, lah. We call it vertigo is the spinning sensation. So this spinning sensation, um. Is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis, lah. So we need to find out what uh, is the source of the vertigo. Oftentimes, there is no test to determine the source of the vertigo. Mm. We go by history, lah. The story, lah. Okay. Uh, so there is a quite common type of vertigo we call positional vertigo. Mm. Okay, positional vertigo is when you start to get violently dizzy when you move your head or move your body in a certain way. But this dizziness lasts for only a few seconds. When you steady yourself, it tends to settle down. Yeah. Okay. There's another type of vertigo that lasts for hours. You start vomiting and for days also have. Huh? For days also they have. Ah, days also got. Yeah. So this sort of vertigo, you need to dig a little bit further. It can um, the majority of vertigo is caused by some kind of issue in your balancing organ, your ear. But vertigo can also be caused of some brain issues, especially in your cerebellum, yeah. the back here, strokes, tumors, and things like that. Mm. Um, and also, vertigo can be caused of some eye issues as well. Eye issues uh, with some refractory issues. Your glasses are not the correct power. It can give you vertigo. But the majority of the time, it's an ear issue. Sometimes it's a brain issue. Is is there a, a correlation with being dehydrated? Uh, some sometimes people get vertigo because uh, you know I often hear if you get dizzy or headache or whatever you know adults always tell you drink a lot what drink more water drink more water. That's that's more probably related to uh, some kind of hypotension it means your blood pressure is low because you're dehydrated mm. and when you get up your blood pressure drops out little uh, drops a little bit and you start pe- to feel faint rather than a vertigo. Okay. Um. Have you ever fainted? I felt faint quite a number of times when like I was in close mili- to fainting. Uh, when I was in military school. <laughs> in where? When I was in military school last time. RMC. Military school. You went for to military RMC? school. Royal Military College. It's a college, but you guys did military program, uh, For we, for how long? We, uh, I was there for two years. We did uh, military cl- clothes. Basically, live like a soldier for two years. Wait, 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 this is in, in Malaysia. Yeah. After form three, I went there. Form four. Oh, form four five. five. From four, from five. It's sort of a boarding school? Or? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. That must be an um, interesting experience. Huh? Quite good learning experience for me. Not that I would do it again, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, that school yeah, taught me a lot, number one. But mm. it actually gave me a lot of advantages when it comes to scholarships and stuff. How yeah. about the... Mm. Like, let's say boarding school is known to try and instill discipline into students. Huh? Mm. Can you vouch for that? Like, how it affected yeah. you? Yeah. Before I went to to RMC, yeah. I won't say I was spoiled lah, but basically I had things done for myself, uh, for for me lah. Yeah, helpful at home. So I didn't know how to wash my clothes. Mm. I didn't know how to iron my clothes. Um, basically, I just got up whenever I wanted lah. I mean, of course, we had to have some discipline to go to school, mm. but it's nothing like what you learn in uh, military school lah. And there there are other things as well, you know. You have to handle your seniors, a bit of ragging, yeah, things yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. All these things you have to put up with. But it's, it builds you. It la. builds character. Uh, it builds you. La. Yeah, getting bullied actually. Yeah. One thing I, I noticed uh, about, because my dad has 12 siblings. Oh. 11, 12 siblings. Uh, wow. Yeah, those days it's more common, I guess, so, yeah. right? Um, your children become your workers as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's the only one out of all the siblings that went to boarding school. Oh, okay. And what I noticed is he's also the only one that mm. um, has this amount of discipline uh, as compared mm. to um, all the other. Um, just in things like, for example, um, eating healthy and um, mm. exercises. Also, he has a um, corporate job, right? Mm. Uh, most of the others are doing um, 
sort of entrepreneurship, mm. sales, stuff like that. Um, he's the only one that can <laughs> manage to um, survive in a corporate job for many, many years. And I do mm. attribute that to, he attributes a lot of it to his experience in boarding school of how it changed. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the main thing is uh, learning to work under pressure. You know? Yeah. Not a lot of people can do it. You know? um, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, independence is yes, of course, mm. but learning how to, you know, sort yourself out, get your head steady when you're under pressure, you know, not just, not just school staff, you're under mm. pressure from your senior, you know, you have yeah. to do this and that. You know. What sort of uh, curriculum were you guys doing? Did you have to take SPM, for example? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, normal education, uh, yeah. SPM or normal, that we have, but we have a lot of side things, lah. Military training. Mm. We do probably a lot, a bit more sports than uh, your usual school. It's very fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we do. S- not that I play lah, but we play rugby. Where mm. I don't know every school plays rugby. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I something that um I talked about with my buddies on the podcast was a couple of uh, episodes ago, right? We referenced that we remembered that during my time in high school, so one period in school was uh 35 minutes right two periods is about one hour 10 minutes mm. pjk session is one hour and 10 minutes mm. S- i remember when i was from three from four they changed it from two periods to one period which makes it 35 minutes right and if you compare it how many periods do you have in a week um can't remember how many but the percentage that you are spending it on physical education mm as compared to normal curriculum, study subjects and all, it's so tiny, you know, and what what would your thoughts be about that? Uh, I mean, you you have children now? Yeah. How old are they? 14 and 16. What, what do you think about our physical education? I don't know about you lah. Um, the, the, the focus on uh, grades now is a lot higher than what it used to be. What do you mean? Uh, um, the standard of... Yeah, I, I don't know whether kids are getting cleverer or exams are getting easier. I'm not sure. But during my time, uh, yeah. SPM, so uh, uh. if you get all A1s, uh, yeah. you're one of a handful in the country. Did you not, manage to get all A1s? Uh, no, la, I didn't. I uh, wasn't okay. that clever. La, but, uh. but now, uh, yeah. you get all A1s, you're one of the several in the class. You yeah. know, so, so I was I was really thinking... Wow, so terrible this kid. So yeah, saying, you are referencing your children's school, or is it the classmates? Eh, sorry. Ah, yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, just the SPM and oh, all okay. these these days, lah. Yeah. It's like twenty subjects. How on earth do you study for twenty subjects? And then get all A ones, but too, you know, you say, oh yo, this kid. So, I can only think that not to say the exams are easier, but I think the gradings have been it, somewhat lowered. It, or it could be that our children are. I mean, the this generation are getting smarter, perhaps. Possible, like, more resources. Yeah, but, much but, more. But how how they control exam results during my time mm. was that they, for example, uh, um, additional mathematics. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's the one subject where they control who gets straight A ones and who doesn't. So that one literally only you have to get something like 97 or 98% uh-huh. for you. When you say control, right, you mean the bell curve, they are very strict on it. Yes, they yes. don't change it at all. Yes, so yeah. you have to get a nearly perfect results to get an A1. So, in the, at that time, only maybe 50 people in the country will get A1. So, that limits the number of straight A students. Why I think that is important? Because yes. you differentiate the good from the great. Yes. If everybody gets A1, but you are the absolute genius there, but if everyone gets the same result as you, so how are you going to get rewarded? You then don't. it makes you ask the question, what is the purpose of altering the, the, the standard? You know, like Why do you make it easier for students um, on certain years? Because that's what, in, during my time, they, they also mentioned that, oh, last year, you know, you get 70 or 65, mm. it's considered an A or A ah, minus. That's exactly what I mean. So yeah. what is yeah. the purpose of altercation? I think, I think the government has an incentive to make the education look very successful. So the more students we ace, the more the better our education system, which I think is a bit, a bit of a fallacy. It's like. kind of like a quota based. Um, they are trying to they are trying to hit their quotas. I actually heard this just two days ago. Right, I was listening to um, a podcast. Uh, you know who's Doctor Phil? Uh, Doctor Phil, yeah, yeah. so yeah, a very popular right, yeah. media doctor. Mm. He's talking about how 
this was just last year, um, 2022, he's talking about how during his, his time, right, getting an A was, um, sorry, um, passing, eh, sorry, getting getting a C is about 60 and above, right? That's the, sc- the score you must get. As of right now, in today's time in America, this is not Malaysia, if you get above 44, it's a C, yeah. right? So pretty much a, a credit. So they are lowering lowering the um, academic requirements a lot and who is that benefit fitting? That's why I, 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 does make doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to me. Um, yeah, so I don't know how you get around it. Uh, but during um, during my parents' time, yeah. even passing as SPM is very good already. You talk that time that time <laughs> you're talking about grades, you know. No, yeah, yeah. Not even grade one, uh, you're yeah. one of the best already, you know. Uh, so so now there's no such thing as grades really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about um you're very passionate about cycling. Yeah, in the last two and a half years, yes. Oh, only two and only a half I, years. Only, recently only. I'm a I'm a pandemic cyclist. Oh dear. Um <laughs> I assume that it's been at least five, ten years. No, or, no, I, no. I looked at some of your um times and it's pretty good times for someone who is what, two and a half years in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um so I know n- nothing, I can assume I know nothing much about cycling. What were your sort of exercises before you got into cycling? Honestly, I didn't do any exercise before I started cycling. So you mean... So this cycling is a, is a bit of a godsend for me, really. You mean from... I mean, during uni days, you still played sports? Right? I was active in sports in school. Yeah. When I left school, I played a little bit like football in the afternoon. Did you start friends. working that time? No, at that time already no more. It's really very tough. Basically from... I would say from the age of about... 26 until I was about in my 40s I barely did any exercise wow what a it's really like you said like God sent at, at this thank age God, thank God for it because otherwise at my age you really need to do something like you can't just yeah, leave um, around actually you mm. should never stop right yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> ideally yeah. Yeah. how did you suddenly pick up cycling why not running you know I like uh, game sports you know that's why I like record sports mm. where you have where you, play games, uh, where, where you play Is games, where you play games, there's there's yeah. sort of competition. I've always hated endurance sports. You're talking about swimming, right? Got you. Cardio. For me, I it's just you being tired and nothing mm. else, you know. But I don't know why. I I when I saw cyclists last time, I thought, what's the point of this sport? You know, it's just. But when when the pandemic hit, I, strangely enough, it was my wife who suggested, hey, "Why don't you take up cycling?" And she's not a cyclist, by the way. Then why did she? <laughs> I, I don't know why lah. She she just thought, oh maybe it was something that we could do together lah, can mm. cycle together lah. So we just went to Decathlon one day. So I got myself a bike. Yeah. She got herself a bike. You don't cycle before that lah, like at all, right? Yeah. I cycled to school last time yeah. when I was younger. So random, so I need yeah, go to then, the Decathlon. <laughs> But I knew some people who were really into cycling, so I asked them to be offered advice, mm-hmm. things like that. One thing about me, when I get into something, I get into something all in. Yeah. So now my wife doesn't cycle at all. She doesn't yeah. like cycling. Now I'm cycling like all the time. So, mm. um, But it's, it's enjoyable. Um, it's, an endu- it's the only endurance sport that I actually enjoy. Because I feel as if I'm on a motorbike or on a, or on a car, mm. but I'm doing exercise at the same time. Do you... <laughs> First of all, how often do you um, uh, cycle? Cycle outside once or twice a week. Mm-hmm. But I cycle indoors every day. La. Indoors, what do you mean by that? We like have the, a trainer. A bike? A, a tra- what we call a trainer, yeah. where it's actually my bike. By Stationary the bike? Uh, it's, it's a static bike. Yeah. But we have a program, uh, a simulation program. Yeah. We call Zwift. I don't know whether you've heard of it. No, no, not sure. Yeah. Uh, the so you say you cycle outdoors. Are you going longer distance that that during oh, yeah, that time yeah, yeah. compared to when indoors is more of a more relaxed session? Indoors is basically a, an hour of simulated cycling, mm. um, but outdoors, especially in the weekends, we are talking about four to five hours. For, you cycle for four to hours. That is, I looked at your race, some of the race about, times. About hundred hundred k's like, about hundred kilometers. Yeah. Like. Oh my god! So you actually do it? Um, you do four hours sessions on a uh, weekly yeah yeah oh wow i i mean the cycling community this is actually average some some people cycle like all day uh, several times a week you know i don't know where they where to get the time now but, you know. i think it's, it's very fascinating right you compare 
short distance, um, let's say running or short distance sprinting sports, right, compared to long distance, right, visibly you we do see that the mental willpower is much more applicable in long long distance uh, sports. Oh yeah, endurance. Right. Uh, not just endurance. physical endurance, uh, mental endurance. Yeah. Maybe that's something that you enjoy about it. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you you don't do this kind of activities alone. It's always with a group of friends. Uh. So you, you enjoy that kind of activity. La. And those people that you um, ride with, right, they've probably been doing it what the last 10 years. Uh, a lot, uh, most of them have done it a lot longer than I have. So for you to start to join them, you would have to because you cycle together, right? That means that do you guys break off or you all would ride together for the whole Oh, no, ride? no. We don't leave people behind. La. Then you would have a lot to pick up onward, right? Judging that you yeah. just got in. True, true. Uh, so, so what 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 happens during your cycling journey, so to speak? Mm. Um, initially, you start off with a group of guys who are roughly Begins. about your level. La. Yeah. And as you move on your cycling journey, you meet more and more people. Mm. Then you move on to stronger and stronger groups. Yeah. So that's how it works. You challenge yourself. So now, I have two or three groups that I can cycle with. So it depends. Yeah, because if you're doing it with a group, right? Like let's say if you even if you run with a group, right, you have to follow their pace. True, or, true. And those stronger cyclists won't want to cycle with you because they don't want to wait for you. Yeah. So you need to you need to get to their level first before you move yes. on to a stronger group. Right? And they won't they won't say it to you nicely. They will just ghost you. Is it is that how it works? Uh? Um, <laughs> not not initially lah. But I think and you get you, the message. You will, uh? Uh, you will know yourself lah. If every time they have to wait for you, you're the only one at the back. Then then you probably don't belong there. Yet. I <laughs> I think it's like I play badminton right, and then um I have friends that are I play with them once and then I realize oh that's very ob- obvious difference in skill level. Mm, mm. Then. You know, f- f- because if you want to get better, you have to compete with people better. True. So true. I'm always, I want to compete with them. True, true. But they don't want to play with me because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's similar to the yeah, cyclists, yeah. you know, yeah, that yeah, are yeah. more elite. They don't want to, um, and it's not their fault also, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. want to focus on themselves. You want to focus on improving. Yeah. They also want to focus on improving. True, true, true. You've done races? Yes, I have. Yeah. What sort of races? How, how long is the distance? Typical race is um, you can go anything from about forty to fifty kilometers to one hundred and fifty. Right? Uh. Yeah, one hundred fifty is going to be about three four four hours at least. Uh, four if you go really quick la. Yeah. Um, um, there are there are events which are not races. Mm. These are ultra endurance events la. Yeah. These are how far event- do they go? Uh? Ultra oh, endurance. up to a thousand sometimes. A thousand. Uh, Jesus. I have never done a thousand la, but but a thousand is something spans across five six days la. Oh, okay, but they sleep. Uh. <laughs> you have to sleep. Uh. Yeah, I, I tell you. So these ones, these ones are not races, but you have a cut-off time that you need to finish mm. before a certain, certain amount of time. Yeah. So, yeah. To actually mm. complete the race. Uh, if uh, not. To get a certificate or, or something like that. Do you have something like that in mind, like a, a goal that you want to join an ultra marathon? Uh? Uh, I'm not into those uh, ultra-endurance events. Like. I've done... The longest ride I've done is about 200, 200 plus kilometers. Like. 206 hours? Um, ride seven. time is about 7 uh, about seven hours. Um, All together is roughly about 10 hours like, plus your breaks. Do you take leave yeah. the next day? How do you go to work? You know what I mean? No, like, you do that over the weekend. Yeah, but there's going to be a aftermath damage, you know, the next day on your body. Oh, that one you put up with it. Like. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if you do a... a <laughs> your legs will hurt a bit, like, but... but I, with cycling, of course, as you go on, your legs will hurt less. Mm. Um, but it depends on the intensity. La. I find the legs will hurt more in a race. Mm. Because you're really going hell for leather for a long time. Eh? So yeah. you get cramps and things. But this kind of ultra-endurance events, you don't go all out. You just cycle. Of course, the goal is to finish the event, not for yeah. you to go crazy. Eh? When, you, when you go for a race, right... Mm you're going to be performing way better than how you usually perform on your weekly yeah, uh, yeah, like. weekend runs. And it's kind of like, like for example, you train for a marathon, right? you run mm. 5km at a 5-minute pace. Mm. And then when you go for a marathon, right? Like you've never actually ran that mm. far before mm. and you manage to complete the whole marathon at a very similar pace, something mm. that you've never experienced. So that's sort of how it's like, is it? For oh, you yeah, once yeah. You, yeah. you you, you always go a lot, a lot faster in a race, mm. but at some point your 
your you reach your physiological limit as well yeah so we have this term we call bonk in bonk. In, in, means what, uh? in cycling means you just hit the wall and you just run out of energy basically you can't, you can't do it anymore so your, you your can you can get that uh, you can get that um but as as you get more experience and when you train you have some data lah so you know what sort of pace and what sort of power output that you can do Uh, that, that you can sustain lah, so you work based on that lah. Eh, hey, cycling is very when you're doing a cycling uh, race, right? It's very different than running because um, chances of collision, you know, not just with cyclists. Um, there's also going to be other cars, right? right? You have to kind of stay a little bit more focused than if you're doing a normal running marathon, right? Of course, of course. Uh, r- cycling is risky, no doubt. It is no doubt. Uh, crashing, you run into a pothole, dropping and I mean, recently we had cycling, uh, a cyclist who, who passed away. Um, one that, one lady passed away. Just just did a race with us a few days before that. Really? Uh, I I don't recently? know her personally, lah. But oh. she she did the same race as us. Yep. Then went went for just a normal ride. Was trying to avoid a pothole. With a with a group, is it? Was she with a group? Uh, with two or three, a couple of people. Small group. Ah, uh, small group. Yeah. Trying to avoid a pothole, and then the lorry came in from the other direction, just knocked her palm. Abyss. You've ever had any crashes or? I've had a crash before, but that one's just my own stupidity, lah. But there was nothing to do with anyone. Were you else. going fast or? <laughs> that was, that was, that was at the beginning of my cycling time, lah. Yeah. So I was being a bit stupid. I was just actually going round and round my housing area, only. Okay, okay. Uh, but that that one was silly, lah. I, I actually knocked into the car rather than. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so but. Fortunately, I have not had a crash since lah. So of of course, every time when y'all are um going for your rides, right, mm. all padded up, is it? No, no lah. Wow, no. real daredevil. Only the head only got got the, the head. Hammer, uh, oh, you you wouldn't pad the knees or the elbows or what? We want to keep the weight as as low yeah. as possible. Yeah, be fast. So you wear lycra. We carry as little weight as as we let's can. Let's say let's say like tour de France. Mm. Do they do no, they use? Same. They don't use ah. Helmet got lah. Got lah. La, actually, this helmet thing only last 10-15 years only, you know. Before that, they just use a cap. Simply because of the aerodynamic uh, Probably reasons. Probably, keep things light. Uh, yeah. But that was, that was just... Now, it's almost unthinkable now because you get a crash, uh, you don't have a helmet and that's it, uh, you're done. But, but they wear helmet because it's mandatory... Right. Now it's mandatory. Because yeah. if it's not mandatory, people are not going to wear it. Yeah, right? yeah, now it's mandatory. Because they want to be, they want a competitive edge. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, did you happen to watch that uh, documentary Icarus? Icarus? Yeah. Oh, you, oh yeah. No, no, no. So um, this is uh, really interesting. Uh, this um, Brian Fogel, he mm. is the uh, producer, director, also the guy who stars mm. in it, right? He's mm. an avid cyclist. Mm. He loves um, cycling, um always dreamed about competing in Tour de France like ah, that, ah. right? Um, so, he, what he found out, right, or mm. what um, the news found out was, mm. I, a lot of people know mm. this also, everyone is doping uh, in oh, yeah. uh, Tour, Tour de France, right? Not only, be, at first... Last time, uh, now I don't know, but last time definitely. Yeah. Yeah. At first, is Lance Armstrong. He ah. was, um, I think he, he admitted it, right? He had to come oh, out. Yeah, he got, he got caught in a big way. So. Yeah. So, he had to, um, he came out and talked about it and then, what they found out was the next person that was not doping was the person above the 26th position. Yeah. So pretty much most of them in Tour de France were doping. I, I believe mm. the, because they want to use an um, endurance-based uh, steroid, which is what EPO. Yeah. Right? Very, very common mm. Um, mm. EPO for endurance-based mm. um, sports. So this guy, he, Brian Fogel, he started doping 12 weeks before Tour de France. The, The year, the year before he competed, I forgot what result he got lah. But in the mm. in the late in the like late hundreds like that. Sorry, I mean like uh, above fifty like that. Mm. Then twelve um not twelve months and uh, maybe a uh, eight weeks or something later lah. He was on this um um EPO program right. Mm. To he wants to document lah his performance mm. with or without it. Mm. Um weirdly enough, he finished even worse lah. He he. Oh really? Yeah, he had an even worse result, right? Maybe he's just not meant for it because yeah. you see, right? EPO can help you so much, but long distance, a lot of it is up yeah, there. You still have to train. You can do, but you yeah. still have to train. Yeah. You not yeah. only have to train. You have yeah. to have a very 
strong, strong, mm. you know. Mm. You can train as much as someone, you know, but on that day itself, mm. who's going to push harder? Who's yeah, going to, yeah. you know, who can uh, Who can endure pain? Uh, this is what you like to call in cycling. It's pain, it, right? It's the, it's the pain. You have to, well, enjoy the pain, so to speak. Ooh, that's the rush, uh, the high that makes you guys feel alive, I guess. I guess so. Uh. It, it's not so much fun when you're doing it, but, you know, it doesn't stop you doing it, you know, because... Um, I guess it's a will to win, you know. Um, a, a, will, a will to win, um, a lot of it also is similar to going to the gym. You have a good sweat. You kind of feel the well, it's endorphins, ah, is it? Endorphins. Yeah, you feel a rush, you know, and you kind of want that every day. You don't feel normal if you don't have yeah, that. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. Also, I was saying he finished in a position, even he placed even worse stuff mm, than mm, mm. before he was also do- doping. Mm. The scientist that helped him out with it was this Russian scientist. Um, I forgot what his name was. This Russian scientist, right, along the way in creating this documentary, he stumbled upon a secret that was so much more interesting, which is this Russian scientist was one of the, he might have been the head, uh, but one of the scientists in charge of the whole Russian state-sponsored doping program. Mm, mm, mm. So that scientist was working during, I forgot which Olympics, uh, but one of one of the Olympics. So he kind of exposed the whole Russian team, mm. right? All of them were doping, all yeah. of it. They called it a state-sponsored... Um, In the 70s and 80s, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I think it was during that time, uh, you know? So mm. he was behind all of it. He documented how they did everything mm. you know and then once that documentary came out this wasn't too long ago maybe five six years ago mm. the documentary came out it's on uh, netflix if you guys want to go mm. have a look yeah and then he's now on the run uh, he's uh, in hiding somewhere in the russians are looking for him. yeah the, the russians are all <laughs> looking for him it's, it's not new news uh, but this is the olympics are uh, at the highest level of uh, most sports i mean you, you i i saw a few documentaries on this doping especially this east german and russian yeah and, but the way they did it, terrible. Eh? Especially, if they, they didn't do it so much with the men, they did it with, with the women. Yes. Because there's a lot more advantage to be gained. Yeah. Um, Testosterone. You, oh, you look, at, look at some of them, some of the women, they really look like men, you know. They it? do. Crazy, is it? And yeah. their records mm. uh, at certain events are still on until now, you know, 30 years down. Why is you get all the 100 meter records eh? every yeah. year, break, 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 break. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The like for example the four hundred meter record yeah. for a woman that was been since the what was it nineteen eighty uh, running is now. it uh, running, running uh. until now no nobody has even got anywhere near that time obviously it was doping isn't it? yeah Usain Bolt um has he ever been popped I, I'm not sure I don't think he has ever been popped for yeah. steroids or anything yeah. but if you want to look at it this way uh, you know the men's hundred meters time mm. right Usain Bolt was nine nine dot five eight mm. Previously is ten thirty or something, mm. uh, yeah, ten minutes thirty seconds, and that was in, uh, in the seventies, yeah, seventies, sixties or whatever. Sixties, sixties. Uh, so it could be within that time frame, forty years, that humans have evolved. Their training has evolved. Definitely, or what, definitely. Right, yeah. Th- that's definitely. Mm. But it also could be that they are on some more drugs. evolved drugs, lah. Better drugs. PEDs, uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you you were mentioning like a lot of them they use it on girls, right? Like the the female athletes, mm-hmm. right? It's very sad because let's say right, you pump a lot of these steroids into these mm-hmm. female athletes who mm-hmm. since young they've been doing it, mm-hmm. gymnasts, mm-hmm. swimmers, then they have all sorts of side effects, um, uh, what hair growths on their irregular hair growths. Look at, f- look at uh, Flo Jo. Who's Flo Jo? Uh, Florence Griffith Joyner, you know. Oh uh, no, I'm not sure. She's a, she was never caught, mm. but. You're not going to tell me she didn't Co- go. Current, current athlete? No, she's passed away. What, what she happened? Is, I'm um, not familiar. She's still the current 100 meter record holder for women. Yeah. She competed in uh, in the late 80s in Seoul. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing uh, her photo a few years before. She, I mean, she's quite an attractive woman. Yeah, she yeah. Was, and then literally four years later, she became so bulky, you know, muscle. You're yeah, talking muscle. about four years after the After, uh, she, I saw, first time I saw was in the uh, 84 Olympics. Yeah, yeah. She didn't do very well there. Mm. 88 Olympics, suddenly she started smashing all these records like yeah, crazy. Yeah. And she looked a lot more muscular. She tried to camouflage it by being a bit more feminine, la, long nails, yeah, yeah. doing, doing up her hair. Yeah, yeah. But you can see her body is one thing. Her voice started to change. Come yeah. on. That one is very obvious. You know, and then 
she started smashing all those records and of course lah as before she got caught she retired lah a few years later died did did you did oh. they say the reason why or did they know, heart it? heart problems i mean more well, heart problem if you are fit athlete heart problem in, in your 30s come on yeah unless you have uh, some kind of congenital heart defect you know is but she was never caught lah so her her record stayed lah until now yeah um imagine so imagine for these athletes also right, another side of it is so your career as um let's say if you're olympiad 35 year old you know that's already pushing it 35 year old where you retire you know already pushing it unless you are Usain Bolt or Michael Phelps or um a very popular mm. athlete you don't make the most money mm. right olympics mm. um they're doing it for the country they're doing it for glory for success mm. Mm. And then once they retire, you know, let's say if you were never a medalist, you mm. were just a participant, you kind of um, have to deal with all the the side effects of um, the steroids, you know, and mm. maybe your life might never be the same, you know. They they if you ask all these elite athletes, they say they are willing to die. That's that's for, the thing for for glory, you know. Yeah. They know very well what was at stake already. Yeah, yeah. they. They rather be an Olympic gold medalist and die the next year. They're happy. Yeah. It's uh, at that time when you're, well, that's the only thing that's uh, the focus of your life, lah. But yeah. you know, when you have family and things like that, your your perspective tends you to change a little uh. bit. Yeah. So you t- you talk about ultra marathon runners, mm-hmm. right? There's this lady Courtney DeWalter, right? Um, I s- took note of her when she went on the Joe Rogan Experience. Uh. Mm. Yeah. So she does ultra marathons which is about 240 miles right 240 miles that is i don't know how many days that is uh 30 40 hours I, i'm not yeah. sure but what's crazy is so once once you reach the point of ultra marathon the competitions are not that common mm. i mean not they don't have it uh, not held as often mm. and they are often unisex mm. right she beat the number two competitor by 8 hours sorry 10 hours 10 hours mm. the second competitor which means that she could literally you know lay out her bed and take a full nap and she would have still won yeah, the race yeah, yeah. and when you speak when you s- see her interview and she talks about her diet or how she trains mm. and all um, she runs like crazy but mm. her diet is soft drinks and junk food and sweets oh, really? and and she's a very skinny girl who's a school mm. teacher actually ah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so you really find all this type of um, outliers, uh, and a lot of it is they have really insane mental willpower. <laughs> Definitely to do that. I don't know, you know, EPO or no EPO, you know, ultra marathon is another another yeah. whole game, really. Uh. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. I think we have to. All right. Wrap up, really. Yes. Yeah. Long, long time. Long time. <laughs> wow, two hour. Oh my god. <laughs> Usually, I've been asking um, advice to eighteen year old self. Um, now I'll ask a different question. Eighteen year old me, you mean? <laughs> yeah, eighteen year old you. Ah, yeah. uh, no, no. Um, okay. I was asking that for the last. Uh. I don't know how many uh. episode. Now I'll, I'll try something different. Uh. The uh. you ten years ago, uh. right? Something that if he saw the you today, right? Uh-huh. Ten years later, he would be proud of that part of you, that has changed. Oh, yeah. Oh. 10 years ago that's quite recent actually. Uh, Is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is 10 years a recent yeah, I was, thing now? Yeah, it's 37. Eh? <laughs> uh, actually, oh, you're, you're 47. Ah, uh, 47. Oh, you age well, ah. Uh. <laughs> so, I think I would be proud of the cycling thing actually. Yeah, I think um, that's an obvious one. Career-wise, I was already a, a specialist at the time. Mm. So, there's not not much has changed, but the only thing that's really changed Probably a lot fitter than I imagine I would have been at this stage in my life. Mm. But spiritually, also I've improved lah, mm. religiously that sense. Yeah. So yeah, I was never like super overweight or anything like yeah, that yeah. lah. But um, yeah, I don't think I would have been as active as I am. Today. What's your actually? What's your weight difference ah? Ten years ago, just weight. Not so. much. Maybe six, seven kilos. Maybe. Mm. But uh, uh, leaner but, now. Ah, uh, but. I I'm one of those guys I I lose a little bit of weight but you can see one. Uh so yeah. Hey, yeah. 
Apart from cycling, do you do any lifting? Any uh, weight training or what? Not really. No. 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 Okay. You obviously do lah. Yeah. Okay. Um. But let's be honest lah. Um. Cardio is so much more important than weight lifting, and especially even more so when you mm. age, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. You yeah. can be so unhealthy and look jacked and lean and ripped, mm. and mm. on the inside it's all unhealthy. Yeah. Um, true cardio yeah. itself, that is important all the way mm. till the end. Also. When you reach a certain age, you need to do health checks regularly. Yeah. Like, I think, I mean, never mind normal people. Yeah. Um, even my own colleagues, they are afraid of doing health checks. You're talking they, about doctors, though. Yeah, you're talking doctors. Are so scared to thing. do. They do tests on patients all the time, but they themselves, what? Oh, <laughs> do one, do one, do one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that that's uh, I. I never heard that before. Yeah, a but, lot, a lot of my colleagues. Yeah. But they're humans as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is scary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, um, guys, we have done. I think about two hours already. It's a long, long podcast episode. If you stayed with me up till this point, I'm sure you know. And please, I would really appreciate it if you support the channel. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. What you thought about this episode? Your thoughts on Dr. Iqbal? Who you want to see on as a guest? For the next future episodes, guys, Doctor, um, what's your uh, Instagram IG again? Uh? Do you want to? Uh, at doc doc underscore Iqbal underscore ENT. Yep, guys, give him uh. a follow. You see a lot of cool stuff, ENT content, a bit graphic, but they're interesting nevertheless. This is it for today's episode, and we will see you in the next episode, Doctor Iqbal. Thank you. Woke up, I ain't got a job. Okay, don't know what day of the week. Okay, drop a new hit with the squad. Okay, do it and go back to sleep. Okay, okay.